call the meeting to order. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to introduce the new commissioner. Uh, Paul Rennie is the district attorney's appointee. He is a, a distinguished litigator from the law firm of Cooley LLP here in San Francisco. Uh, Mr. Rennie, we look forward to serving with you. Thank you. We will take the roll. Commissioner Studley? Here, and thank you. Commissioner Liu? Here. Commissioner Han? Here. Commissioner Rennie? Here. The first item on the agenda is public comment on matters appearing or not appearing on the agenda that are within the jurisdiction of the Ethics Commission. Seeing no public comment, the next item on the agenda are is proposed amendments to the SIA for the San Francisco Public Library. Uh, Mr. St. Croix, would you like to introduce that matter? Or missing, would you like to introduce that matter? Uh, yes. Um, the, the commission is considering, again, the draft amendments to the SIA for the public library. And there is a, a staff memo um, regarding this. And what we've done, essentially, is um, set forth uh, changes that the commission talked up briefly about the last time. And, and that is really to retain a couple of the provisions that um, we had thought about eliminating last time. Um, but we would keep these two provisions. These are provisions B and C, except for deleting uh, certain terms so that uh, no, li no employee or the city librarian may be employed by or provide services in exchange for compensation as a sales representative, a purchaser, or a publicist for a publisher of databases or for a publisher uh, for a publisher who sells books to the library. Um, we believe that these amendments will address the concerns raised by the commission at the last meeting. And I'm happy to take questions. I know that Joe Bourne, who is the deputy city librarian, is also here. Thank you, Ms. Singh. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Bourne, do you have any comments you'd like to make before we discuss the issue? Okay. Okay, great. Uh, it, it, it does appear that the staff has revised the language as we discussed at our last meeting. Uh, commissioners, any comments with respect to the SIA? Commissioner Sudley. Um, thank you. Um, I'm looking first at item D on page three, uh, which relates to uh, exhibitions booked into the library. And if I read the discussion correctly, it focused on exclusively the uh, exhibit envoy. And I was left wondering whether that's a particular arrangement that the library feels comfortable with, that it's a nonprofit that it's used to working with, and wants not to uh, burden exhibits through that organization or whether it was an example of a larger category. If it's the first, then I wondered whether it mightn't be simpler to leave the provision in place and, the, and simply do an advanced determination about that one entity that is a nonprofit that it's used to dealing with, has a, what did I say, a, you know, a, a history of um, collaboration and, in fact, that seems like we were involved with either creating it or want it to have a comfortable pathway. And the reason I ask is because I think that the, I could see some potential downside to other exhibits that people worked on from the library. Um, on a, that were that where there was then compensation from the library for that exhibit being shown there that might be problematic. Long way around of saying, is Exhibit Envoy an example of something that happens with lots of different organizations, or is it this is something we would hate to burden because it's working well and we expect this kind of collaboration? 
So I think that's a question for the librarian. Yes, good afternoon, commissioners. Jill Bourne, deputy city librarian. Um, and so per your question about the exhibits, I think that the, our recommendation to remove this section was to your question that Exhibit Envoy is just one example. And that um, to our, you know, uh, exhibits is actually a quite small part of our overall operation. The much bigger part, especially where we uh, work with vendors and where we have funds exchanged is through the largest commodity we purchase, which is our collections, which is both electronic and physical collections. And so we were much more focused on that. In addition, the, um, the co all of our exhibits go through a contract process as well, and so they are monitored through that, uh, through that mechanism. And a large number don't have any funding exchange. They're sort of uh, organizations in the community that want to put something on display that goes along with a program or a service or a collection that we offer and so we c create those connections um, and I, so I think that to your question it's really as a category again a smaller part we didn't feel that it should be called out if there's a specific conflict of interest concern that it could be folded in with a sort of larger umbrella Conflict. statements about the staff and that um, to call it out sort of makes it seem like it's a bigger problem than it is or a bigger issue uh, also we were concerned about that chilling effect that because exhibits envoy isn't the only uh, exhibits group in town we had other examples that came forward from staff that had to do with nonprofit entities such as an arts collective that a staff member who is an artist in their own time of a, in a nonprofit that um, can display their art through that nonprofit does it prohibit us from being able to have their work on display in a library as part of another entity and so there, there were multiple smaller examples uh, not just exhibits envoy are there any for-profit entities uh, that book ex exhibits with the library? I didn't bring any examples, and I could certainly look into that. I can't think of any uh, off the top of my head. We work largely with um, uh, exhibits that are moving around, such as through the Smithsonian, um, other uh, entities such as museums, and um, and mostly nonprofit. But I. I would need to sort of confirm that. I have another question uh, while she's with us. Um, on the following item about providing, being employed by or providing services, uh, compensated services <coughs> as an instructor. Uh, what I'm wondering is whether staff of the San Francisco Public Library are working through this company referred to here or any other companies to provide training to employees of the San Francisco Public Library? Or is the example that you're talking about somebody from the San Francisco Library working with them to provide training to other libraries? That is the example, yes. That um, okay. Because we are a large metropolitan library with a lot of uh, um, specialized knowledge in our mm -hmm. staff, we are often called on to do training for libraries statewide, either through info people or through the California State Library. And then our, our practice in it has always been that if it's done on non-work time, um, staff may or may not, may choose to be compensated uh, because they're working outside of the work, out of the library. It may also be that they are, they get permission to do this and as a representative of the library and do it as part of their work. Would there be a point when they'd be asked whether, where, where your library, our library, I like to think of it, uh, the San Francisco Library would be aware whether the person was doing training that they had developed, for example, internally <laughs> for uh, their own colleagues to train people within mm -hmm. the San Francisco Library that then some external entity says, you are knowledgeable in this and capable of giving that training, would you give it through us to someplace else? I'm not aware of that happening, although I certainly could imagine it, mm -hmm. and that I, I know that in that sort of a situation, if they developed a training as part of the work that they were assigned to do, staff would ask for permission to share that with other entities, other libraries, the California State Library, um, and would not be compensated for that. 
or perhaps the library might seek to be compensated for it, but that's a different question for another day. Um, okay, this uh, we have no precedent for that. I think, you know, part of our mission is uh, is around instruction in that it isn't just to provide access to materials, it's to teach people how to use them. So instruction is such an inherent part of our operation that we do it quite naturally. And um, I think this, this came up last time we discussed this, that that was why it was, um, that's why the, the issue came up, that we want our staff to be providing instruction to um, their colleagues and also to the community. I have a question. Hand. Um, who makes the decision um, to hire um, training entities for the San Francisco Public Library? Or is, or is this organization just automatically used uh, in training courses? Um, no, we use a variety of sources, and actually our, our um, HR director is here, and the HR department manages the training for the staff internally within the library. So if you want to answer that. Good afternoon, Donna Marion. I'm the library's human resource director. And yes, we have uh, the library HR training division. We have a training officer. And um, the training officer will seek a vendor um, that would be able to offer the specific type of training that we're interested in within the library system. So is it the training officer then that makes uh, all decisions uh, as to what um, uh, companies uh, we contract with? Um, most of the decisions. It depends if, you know, if someone else is doing a training that's outside of uh, HR training. But for HR training, she would consult with me and we'd make a final decision together actually on uh, our contracts for training for staff. And Thank you. You're welcome. Um, just as a, a as a comment, I mean, one of the things that um, concerns me is that um, uh, our library has a stellar reputation, uh, not just within California, but across the country. And I, I would be concerned that um, we would prevent library staff from participating in trainings of other institutions because that adds to the reputation and yeah, I think it's something that uh, we should all be proud of. So I, I would hate to prevent that opportunity for library employees. I wanted to just add one more piece of information to Donna's comments in that the, we do an annual training plan that is approved by the management team and the city librarian. So it is around what topics we will be training over the course of the year, what our training priorities are, and then the training officer uses that to identify appropriate trainers within those topics. Commissioner Luke. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to go back to subsection D on the discussion with the exhibit. Yes. So it does um, make a reference in the discussion about how um, there's a different guideline that directs how exhibits are placed into the library. Yes. So can you um, sort of educate us a little bit on what exactly is that process and how is library staff involved or not involved in that process? Certainly. We have a, um, two main documents, and I don't know if they were shared with you in your packet. Um, one is the exhibition guidelines, and one is the exhibitions policy. The policy is adopted by the Library Commission, and it, it basically speaks to the role of the library in tying the exhibitions in with our mission to provide access to information on as broadly as possible to diverse audiences. The exhibition guidelines ex just explains um, it is, is actually very functional. The, the bottom section that you'll see, or the, sorry, the, the fifth paragraph talks about the selection criteria and that the library may sponsor exhibitions from organizations or individuals, individuals that are engaged in a wide range of educational, cultural, or intellectual activities. The proposals are evaluated based on a set of criteria that are listed here. And they are evaluated by, um, we have an exhibition staff as well as a committee of staff who plan out exhibitions for the year and then evaluate the um, proposals to fit in with those different categories. And we typically tie them in with the same topics as we're promoting our collections and programs, such as in February, we just finished Black History Month. We would have a set of programs to highlight our collections as well as exhibitions. 
that that bring attention to those so it is done by a staff group and then they review it to make sure that we are capturing a wide audience so that's actually our um, our preference and it talks a little bit about um, our right to select or not select items because we do get a lot of interest from people in the community um, who want their materials displayed and so we have to have the the leeway to select them based on uh, what topical interests we're trying to satisfy okay thank you so is the um the exhibits commit i don't know if it's called a committee or this it is it's called the exhibition committee the exhibition they, committee i'm sorry and then they meet quarterly okay. to sort of review what's planned and plan out and they actually plan out one to two years in advance because large shows that come from places like the smithsonian often are scheduled uh, way in advance oh i see yeah okay and are they the same individuals who then work on the actual exhibition itself? and then there's a there's a core from that committee that are staff in the exhibitions unit at the library and they are curators typically and there we do have um, three curators and they um, they're the ones who implement the show as well as um, you know, uh, deal with the vendor or the, the the entity that's bringing the materials so they deal with the contract the they do a condition reporting you know similar to a museum okay okay thank you any other questions for miss Bourne I have a hypothetical that may be for you miss Bourne or maybe for, for <coughs> the staff and the city attorney's office but, but I assume that if someone were to be hired as a consultant for, for pay uh, by an organization and that organization wanted to be an exhibitionist at the library, that that person could not play any part in the decision-making role to bring that exhibit in, right? Ms. Singh, do you want to? Um, that that's probably yes um, generally speaking under the conflict of interest laws they apply to all city employees and officers you cannot engage in a um, governmental decision that affects your financial interests so if you were a consultant hired by a library you would not be able to engage in or participate in any decision making regarding those exhibitions okay thank you any fur anything further for Ms. Bourne or Ms. Miriam? Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Public comment on this matter? Good evening. I guess that would be me, David Pilpel, and welcome to the new commissioner. Um, I can't believe we're talking about this again. Is this like the third or fourth time? Um, I am in support of uh, adopting these changes. Uh, just a couple of uh, quick notes. I appreciate the attached uh, copies of the policies and I had uh, previously requested that they be hyperlinked on the uh, final version when that's posted on website. I assume that that can happen. I uh, just wanted to clarify the collection development plan and collection development policy that are attached. If those are the terms then maybe just adding the the word development on that line on page one would um, be good. Also on page three, this appears to just be a minor typo. What was section E? It looks like there's a, a new subsection C with nothing there. Is that? It, it's an automatic thing that it will get taken care of when. We have people to do these things. No, no, no. It's yeah. an automatic thing on machine. Can we blame Bill Gates for that? <laughs> I'd like to. I'd really like to. Okay. Um, other than that, I hope that you'll um, adopt this and we can move on to other things. The library does a wonderful job, and um, thank you very much. Mr. Pebble, what, what was the first change that you asked about? Uh, the collection development plan and collection development policy. The language on page one just says public library collection policy and collection plan. I don't want it to be confused with something else. I'm seeing heads nodding. Thank you very much. Thank you. So missing, we can we can fix that part. Um, I would have to check with the library to see what the real names are. Yeah. Okay. We will. Yes. Miss Bourne. That I think that was just an oversight internally. We refer to it as a collection plan so much that we just I didn't include development, but we can add that. Okay. Great. Thank you. 
Commissioners, anything further? Is there a motion to approve the S? Sorry, was there additional public comment? I'm sorry, ma'am. Thank you, Commissioners. My name is Andrea Grimes. I'm Special Collections Librarian over at the Main Library. I just wanted to give you some staff input, um, which I've done pre at previous meetings here. Um, we, the library staff has uh, uh, had lots of input into this uh, SIA. So um, the, the administration has heard from us. We've worked very well with the administration on making changes, on making recommendations, and also making sure that everyone knows that this is a very good document at this, at this point that would work very well and assist us in um, making decisions and benefiting the public who we work for um, in coupling uh, this document with um, our professional uh, our professional um, ethics, code of ethics. So the library uh, community uh, um, has professional ethics that apply to our jobs uh, and the work that we do. We also, for my uh, job, there's also professional ethics for special collections librarians. So all of these plus peer review um, really add up to a, a really good set of policies. And I'm very happy that this, um, that this document will hopefully be approved by you because I think it's just, it's another thing that will help us do our job well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion to approve the SIA? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes. The next item on the agenda uh, thank you, Ms. Warren and Ms. Uh, Miriam, for your time. The next item on the agenda is consideration of request for waiver for the one-year employment ban for Robert Selna. Uh, Ms. Singh, would you like to introduce this matter? Sure. Um, Rob Selna, who is a former legislative aide with uh, former supervisor Ross Mercurimi, has asked the commission to grant him a waiver from the one-year post-employment restriction that is set forth in the Campaign and Governmental Conduct Code. Um, Mr. Sona is here. Um, there is also a staff memo regarding this, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Singh. Uh, Mr. Sona, do you have any introductory remarks you'd like to make? Yes, I do. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to come and speak to you this evening. And thank you for reviewing the materials I sent you, including the letter requesting the waiver of the ban and the addendum that I sent after that. I presume you got both of those. Uh, so thank you for reviewing those. Um, I know you've, you've, um, you've read my background and you understand it pretty well, so I'll just be very quick about that. And I'll be very quick about the reason I'm here before you, and then I wanted to move into talking about what undue um, influence and unfair advantage means um, in the second half of my presentation. So uh, very quickly, I worked for Supervisor Mercury for 10 months um, after a long career as a journalist, um, most recently at the San Francisco Chronicle, until uh, Supervisor Mercury was elected sheriff. Um, and so my job ended uh, on January 7th. Um, I, I had hoped when I took the job with Supervisor Mercury that this would be a career transition for me and that I would move into working in government service for, for a city agency or department. It turns out that there is uh, extraordinarily limited hiring right now in the city. You may or may not know that, but because of the economy and the tight budget, uh, there, are not, there are not a lot of positions that meet my background and experience in policy or communications available right now. Um, so I'm unemployed and I'm looking for work uh, full-time and part-time if I can get it. And given my background, a natural fit for me is public affairs work, uh, representing uh, people who have a need for representation with the media because of my media background and with the city because of my understanding of the functions of city government and the rules and procedures that are inherent to city government and somewhat arcane to people who aren't familiar with them. Um, a ban on me when I'm going out and seeking employment is, puts me at a severe disadvantage because I could encounter, encounter a potential client who may or may not know 
whether they will want representation with the city to a commission or a department or a representative of some other sort when they're talking to me. And to come to a potential client with a liability like that, whether they know they're going to need that kind of com communication or not, to have that liability for a year is an extreme hardship. I mentioned that in my background, but I wanted to reiterate it. So just a very quick reiteration of the reasons I do not believe a waiver would create potential for undue influence or an unfair advantage. Uh, I worked as a legislative aide for 10 months for a supervisor at the end of his tenure who did not have a powerful position at that time and has now moved to a narrowly focused elected role without general political influence in the sheriff's office, except over law enforcement matters. As a legislative aide, I mostly interacted with other legislative aides and lower level staff and importantly, um, rarely the decision makers themselves. Uh, as, as most legislative aides do. Uh, all, the all the legislative matters that I worked on and actively sought to be approved uh, that had Supervisor Mercury's name on them are completed or discontinued. And I think that's important to keep in mind specifically because this is a one-year ban. And I don't know all the origins for this one-year ban, but I presume that it had something to do with, with the writers of the law being concerned that issues would still be outstanding or legislation would still be pending that the legislative aide had some special knowledge about, some special relationship with regard to, or had worked directly with somebody who he would then go or she would then go and try to influence within that year period. Um, as I mentioned in my letter, I was working on a plastic bag ban legislation and it had one vote. It's now had its second vote. That was the last one that I'm aware of that, that had Supervisor Mercurimi's name on it. Um, to move on, I've had no previous or outside political contacts and I'm not associated with any political, politically influential group in the city or individual in that regard. I was never a political fundraiser, donor, or a member of a political advocacy organization, community group, merchants association, or any entity organized to gain influence or advantage over governmental decisions before I took my job and I'm not now. I have never worked on a campaign in any substantive way, and I have never made a financial contribution to a campaign in this city. A one-year restriction on my communication with, with City Hall, as I've stated, will severely restrict my employment options while I wait for an opening with a city department, which will take an unknown amount of time. I've been unemployed for more, nearly two months now, and I believe I'll have a challenge finding contract consulting work with the one-year ban imposed on me. Uh, so that's the background. And I just, because I understand a broad waiver is a relatively new proposal to this commission, I wanted to provide a little more information as I did in my addendum about the, the, term, the terms that are pivotal in making a decision on granting a waiver or not. Um, and, and I just wanted to reiterate that the, the commission must give consideration to the waiver as much as it does to the ban itself because if it were the rule that by definition legislative aides had undue influence and unfair advantage simply because they had been legislative aides for a year, then the, ban, uh, then, the, then the waiver of the ban would be irrelevant and we wouldn't be talking about it. The commission must analyze whether a waiver would create a potential for undue and unfair advantage. And as I said in my addendum to my letter, not just the possibility whether there exists a potential for any influence or advantage. And that's why the, the context of a governmental environment and particularly City Hall are extraordinarily important to keep in mind when you make your decision. I listed in my letter there are many, many, many groups and individuals who come to City Hall on any given day who are hoping to influence a governmental decision and have relationships with commissions, boards, departments, and supervisors. And that's the context in which you have to consider my request for a waiver. There are merchant and neighborhood association leaders, community activists, campaign fundraisers and donors, longtime constituents, former longtime city workers, and nonprofit leaders, to name a few, many who have long-standing relationships and close ties with departments and supervisors. In my letter, I gave the example of a community act advocate or activist who has brought essentially ready-made legislation to supervisors in the past to solve a community problem. 
It's a very common thing in City Hall. It's encouraged. It's part of the democratic process. And people work with supervisors and departments all the time to solve issues that are confronting their neighborhoods, their communities, transportation, land use, any, anything, you name it. That's the type of situation or person that the commission has to decide I'm distinguishable from because those people have influence and influence is a common part of uh, city hall, the city hall world and any, any other governmental environment. As I say, it's part of the democratic process. So you have to decide that I'm distinguishable from all those groups because of my 10 months of experience working in a supervisor's office on relatively low level matters and without a lot of political background. I can imagine that there would be reasonable concern about undue influence or unfair advantage in my circumstance were it to be the case that Supervisor Mercury were still a supervisor and I had worked for him and I had left and I, there was potential that I would come back and talk to him because he was still a supervisor. Uh, I can imagine reasonable concern if Supervisor Mercury had been elected mayor or senator or some high level powerful political position where when I went to communicate with departments or commissions or aides in the future, they might believe that I had a close relationship with him and wanted to stay on his good side. I also can imagine there being a situation where I worked closely with a supervisor who's currently on the board that is still pending. Uh, and, bef and, and that I could communicate with them on that matter. None of these situations exist. Now, since I wrote you my letter and the addendum, I've given this a little more thought. I've been thinking about it quite a bit, as you might imagine. And I thought that there's still, and after, after thinking about it, I imagine there could still be a concern that if I communicated with the sheriff's department, there could be potential for undue influence and unfair advantage because I worked directly with Supervisor Mercurimi on a number of matters. And so I would urge you to consider um, rather than a complete broad ban, uh, carving out an exception and banning me from communicating with the sheriff's department but giving me a waiver for the other departments. So I, I urge you to think about that if you want to continue this and think about it or if you want to think about it tonight, it's up to you. But I hadn't mentioned that in any of my correspondence and I think it um, is something you, you, sh you should consider because that's an instance, aside from the ones I listed, where there could be, I believe, reasonable concern about undue influence or unfair advantage. Um, the ethics staff wrote you a letter saying that they didn't believe there were enough facts to make a recommendation. Um, I, I think there are situations in which undue influence and unfair advantage could exist, and I think the facts would show them. But the reality is the facts show, the facts show that this is not one of those situations. So. With that, I'll conclude. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about my experience, my, you know, 10 months as a, a legislative aide or anything else. I also have asked uh, a gentleman to come and speak today, Joe Boss, who um, I've asked to come and speak because I've known him in a number of contexts from the time I was a reporter to some of my time working at City Hall to provide another person who can give you context about City Hall and how it functions. I don't want you to get this sort of just from the person who has a vested interest in the outcome uh, of your review. And so I asked Joe, who is involved with the Dog Patch Neighborhood Association, the Potrero Boosters, is on the uh, power, has been on the power plant task force and done many things with City Hall, and in, and in ways is representative of the type of person that I described, the community advocate, the involved person who at City Hall uh, would have some level of influence or advantage. And as I mentioned, you have to sort of be um, reviewing my level of influence or advantage against people like that. So I asked Joe to come and speak about his, his view of the context of City Hall and, and, and city government. So. Mr. Selna, th thanks for your comments. Sure. And, and perhaps we can have Mr. Boss speak uh, during public comment. And if we have questions for him, we're, we'll, we can address those. But while we have you, uh, perhaps if the commissioners have questions for you. Sure. Uh, you can answer them now. Commissioners? Commissioner Liu? 
So um, thank you, Mr. Sona, for coming sure. today. Um, I definitely do understand that you need certainty in pursuing your job. I think what I am struggling with here is that in order to make a decision on a waiver, which we take seriously and don't want to grant lightly, sure. is normally I feel like I would need to know what are the anticipated communications, and I, I know that you've tried to address that as best you can, not knowing where you might land. And so that is the difficulty I'm having, is that it's hard to know what would be undue influence or what your involvement may or may not be if we don't know what you anticipate your communications might be or the nature of those communications with the city during this next year. And so that's what I'm having some difficulty with. And I suppose, um, you know, related to that, we could ask you questions such as, you know, you say in your background that you have, um, that you're pursuing, are you looking at real estate or land use type work? Is that correct? Or did I misread I, that? I, 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 I didn't say that specifically. I was looking for that kind of work. I am seeking contract. I'm seeking full-time work with a city agency still, and I'm seeking contract work if I can find it that um, might include representing clients to the media and might include representing them to uh, the city. Uh, it would be the kind of uh, public affairs work where people um, need to understand how you know, city functions in a particular in a particular way, and what the rules and procedures are, and sort of what outreach is necessary to get things into the right place, and and you know, give them the context for for a project going before city hall, or a set of you know ideas or businesses or uh, goals they may have. So, a particular subject matter area uh, is 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 not really particularly. I'm not seeking a particular subject matter area. I, I, I mentioned in my letter that I had potential for work, potential for contract work for uh, the Fort Mason Center, which is has a, uh, in mind an effort to try to extend the F line, the historic F line train from the center of Fisherman's Wharf down to Fort Mason because there's track and there was uh, there's a long history of a desire to do that. And so the Fort Mason Center needs things like, you know, outreach to the community, and it needs um, help with their website and creating a petition and help with generating positive uh, media around the effort and potentially help with knowing, uh, you know, what's going on at the, um, with the Park Service Environmental Review and uh, potentially knowing where the MTA is prioritizing the funding for the project and its range of things it uh, funds. So that's an example. And p as part of that, as I, as I described, it's, it's very difficult because as part of that, they might need me to communicate with a department, a commission, a representative, so, and so forth uh, on their behalf related to a government decision. So it's... That's the conundrum I'm in. I understand the, the, the struggle you're uh, confronting. Um, but I think the type of communication, uh, that's why I was trying to emphasize that the specific type of communication I don't think is really at issue, and it's whether any communication would provide potential for undue influence or unfair advantage given all the categories of people who are on a regular basis in a position where they have some level of influence or advantage because of their relationships <coughs> with City Hall. And that's why I was trying to get you to focus on that rather than the unknown type of communication. It, you know, it, there's not too broad a range of communications it could be. Um, so, and that's also why I recommended that you consider maintaining the ban on my communication with the Sheriff's Department because that's an obvious relationship I've had mm -hmm. um, and and I, I, the rest of the work I would do I don't don't think presents any potential given what I've described mm -hmm. well so it, well, and, and the other point that I understand you're making is that the legislation or whatever you worked on with the uh, supervisor Mercurimi is completed yes right but I guess I would be looking at the next step I mean certainly there are effects 
of legislation or I mean just because something was passed or not passed doesn't mean that there couldn't be something down the pike that perhaps a group later on wants you to help them navigate related to what you worked on while you were with Supervisor okay. Mercurini. So Okay, well let's take so, that let's take right. that, let's take that instance. Let's say that instance occurs. Is that going to give me any more influence than somebody who has brought other le legislation to another supervisor uh, over the years or, or contributed to their campaign or uh, worked as a fundraiser for them or is a constituent that they've worked with for eight years? I mean, that's my point. Uh, they're, they're, because you're a legislative aide for 10 months, which is all I was, and the types of relationships and understanding of how things work I could develop in 10 months. There's, there's not a possibility I would have undue influence. I'm not saying people wouldn't listen to me. I'm not saying I wouldn't have some advantage because I might know somebody's name or phone number. The question you have to decide is whether that's undue influence and whether I'm distinguishable from all those other categories of people who've had relationships with supervisors, who've had relationships with departments, who've worked on legislation before. That's the test. It's not, as I said, it's not whether a legislative aide would, would not have any influence at all. That's not the question. Well, so, I mean, I think you sort of made that point that anything we'd be looking at is basically a hypothetical. It's just speculative. And so that's why, to me, this seems... Well, no, it's not speculative because there are just instances... Tell I apologize. If you could just let... Oh, I'm sorry. Move. Right. Yeah. So, I, thank you. Um, thank you. So, to me, it seems premature. And I would... I mean, I would want to know a little bit more about actual facts as they came to pass before granting a waiver. Because to me, if we did this based on, if we granted a waiver, even limited to just this department or that department, it still, to me, seems like it's based on hypothetical or speculation. So to me, that would be tantamount to just saying um, this post-employment <coughs> ban doesn't apply to a legislative aid or doesn't apply to a legislative aide who has worked for 10 months. And I'm not sure that I'm prepared to do that with, you know, just to write it out. Unless, you know, Ms. Ng, I guess a question for you is what the actual, um, is there a question about whether this applies to legislative aides? I mean, is that an open question at all? The uh, the, ban, the one year ban uh, on communications with your former department, as far as it applies to, I mean, the, the for legislative aides, it applies to communications with all city departments, all city commissions, all city employees, all city officers. That is in the law itself. Um, with respect to most other employees of other departments, for instance, employee with the Ethics Commission, only, the one-year ban would only apply to communications <coughs> with the Ethics Commission to influence a governmental decision. But there is an exception carved out for the mayor, for the members of the Board of Supervisors, and also for uh, the legislative aides of the supervisors. So it is in the law itself that the one-year ban applies to communications of all city departments. Okay, thank you. Any further questions for Mr. Selna? Oh, just a comment. Um, my feeling is that you're presenting us with a problem that doesn't yet exist. Um, uh, as uh, the previous commissioner mentioned, I mean, this is all hypothetical. Um, <coughs> this legislation is not intended to prevent you from gaining employment. And as someone who spent many, many years as a public affairs um, professional with many companies, um, there's no reason to think that you can't find um, a public affairs position, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you will be interacting with the city and county of San Francisco in any way whatsoever. So I think that um, to grant you a waiver prior to you having a position um, is really not something that we're prepared to do. Uh, certainly I'm not. Um, 
But if you should find a job where there is going to be a clear problem, then that would be the time to come back and ask for a waiver if it's clear that you are going, it's a job where you do need to communicate with the city and that there are some areas that need to be carved out or that we need to consider. But um, I, it just, the whole thing is, it seems premature as, um, uh, as has been pointed out. Commissioner Rennie. Mr. Sullivan, thanks yes. for coming in, and I sympathize with your position. But when you cited, for example, the Fort Mason Center mm -hmm. as being an example, many of the things that you said they would want you to do would not in any way be impacted by this ban, right? Correct. And your only concern is that they may then ask you to do something that would be impacted by the ban, but why isn't that the point to come to us and say, I've got this job, I'm doing these things, they've now asked me to communicate <clears throat> with the city agency, and I would like to have a waiver because what they're asking me to do, I'm not going to be able to exert any undue influence beyond that what any other citizen could do. And then we could deal with it, but, but, and I guess I have a question to the staff or the city attorney, has, has this commission ever given sort of a blanket waiver without a specific uh, situation where the applicant is saying, I'm being asked to communicate and I want to now have a waiver? Uh, the answer to your question is no, the commission has never done that. May I respond to your what you said? Please do. Uh, I, well, it's I understand it's the case that the commission hasn't done this. Uh, this provision in the law wasn't in place, wasn't put in place until 2007. <coughs> um, so it's a newer provision to an existing law about a communication ban. Previously, it was that de people who worked in departments or worked as, and I'm not sure if legislative aides were included at all, but. It, the, the ban was on the department you specifically worked for. And then it was added in 07 that it applied to any department commission anywhere in the city, regardless if you had had any contact with them or, or anything. So it's part of the reason possibly it's the, a broad ban has never happened. That provision didn't exist until 2007. The other thing is I agree with you, I'm, and I'm, I'm happy to provide details when I have a specific contract opportunity in mind um, and come back to you. Uh, what, I, what I tried to state at the outset was I'm seeking work. And, and while I, I understand there, there may be jobs out there that don't um, require this and that they might be happy to wait for me to get a waiver, as I said at the start, I'm competing with a lot of people it's a difficult job market. I'm competing with a lot of people for a small number of potential positions and to come with them, to come to them with a limitation on what, what I can do uh, makes it all that more difficult to compete. And given the context that I had worked as a legislative aide for all of 10 months um, and keeping in mind the level of connections and relationships people have at City Hall and other governmental environments, Comparatively, I felt mine was so low and that my experience was so limited that uh, you might consider a broad waiver. So that's, that's the reason I'm here. Commissioner Studley. Uh, the advantage of um, going last is that other people have made um, uh, many of the same uh, points. I uh, sympathize with the constraint on um, job searching. I agree with Commissioner Han that, um, and Commissioner Rennie that most of what you described as it, within your examples were things that you um, could do um, or can find appropriate ways to do. You can provide background to people about your understanding of how things work within government <coughs> if it doesn't involve your direct communication to government, for example. So. Uh, much of what you're describing is uh, possible. I've worked under post-government employment bans myself, and um, while they are 
uh, limiting, they are not necessarily designed because of any particular person's access to um, a, a specific set of knowledge or a particular background on issues. It is really a public perception that having been in those roles in general, we may have access or opportunities to influence or, or that our calls will be taken um, more quickly or that we have friendships inside government that might allow us to behave in different ways. And while the 10 months or six months or a year and a half might lead you to say, well, but on these facts, um, it seems more narrow and the rules shouldn't apply, uh, I think that's not what the law asks us to do. And so I agree with uh, the colleagues who've spoken about the idea that uh, we would be much better able to act, and I hope act, in a timely way if you came before us with a specific set of circumstances to go through the, the steps which I think are uh, to grant a waiver which is not that we have to prove that there could be undue influence, but that, it's, that it would be necessary to establish that there is not potential for undue influence. Um, and I realize you were very modestly trying to convey that to us, but without being able to describe an agency or a type of communications, it was very hard to see um, how those facts might play out or how to balance the ban against a narrowly crafted um, protection. And I'm not convinced that limiting it to the sheriff's office or even the sheriff's office and the board of supervisors itself would satisfy um, the requirements in such an abstract situation. So I, I would join the others who've spoken about not being comfortable acting um, under these circumstances. Mr. Selna, a question, question for you. Are you seeking uh, contract work for many specific entities at the same time? In other words, are you trying to be a consultant with, with a number of different clients? Or are you looking for, such as the example with the Fort Mason Center, a full-time job or, or as much as full-time as it can be for a short period of time? The, the Fort Mason Center would be a contract job for a limited period of time. I don't know how long it would last. Um, I'm doing what anybody would do when they're unemployed. I'm seeking employment to put, either get a full-time job or put together as many part-time jobs as I can to pay my mortgage and my bills. Whether that turns out to be two projects or four, you know, I have to meet my financial obligations and my needs. And so it's a kind of a um, evolving process and an ongoing process. And I'm doing the thing that people do when they're, you know, looking for work. They're, I'm uh, uh, talking to as many people as I can. I'm networking. I'm, you know, asking people if they know people who need help on things. Uh, I'm doing all those kinds of things. It's, uh, you know, as you know, it's not as simple as there, there being a list of places for you to go and talk to people. I'm having to cultivate opportunities um, by, you know, as I said, by networking and doing what anybody would do. Um, in my situation and trying to utilize whatever skills and background and knowledge you have. Uh, so I can't add, I, you know, it's. I think I understand your, your, your position. How far along are you in the Fort Mason uh, process? Is that still a viable option for yes. you? Yes, yeah, it um, is. What, is it st would it be helpful for us, for you, for us to discuss and evaluate whether there would be any conflict with respect to that particular um, job as you uh, go along in the process? Because it doesn't sound to me like we, you're going to have the votes to, to get the sort of waiver that you are seeking. Right. No, um, I but that. I think we're all sympathetic to your situation yeah. And, yeah. And, and certainly uh, understand where you're coming from and, and want to be want to be helpful but but you are asking for something that is unprecedented and for which we just don't have the other side to evaluate <coughs> against it you know and, and I think if you came back there are probably many jobs you could come back with for which you would receive a re favorable reception because of you and, and that's when your limited experience um, you know your your arguments would be 
probably much more persuasive because mm -hmm. then we'd, we'd understand what the other side is. Yeah, I understand that, and I appreciate your, you know, uh, challenge in this as well. I, I really do. Um, I, as I say, I would be happy to come back with if if something turns into a concrete um, need to to communicate um, with a city department or a commission or a representative. <laughs> I will, I will come back. The, the struggle from on my end is, you know, while bills are pending and, and, and expenses are mounting, your commission meets once a month. Uh, and so there's, it do, that again is not particularly convenient, you know, when you're seeking work. Um, sure. We, we have in the past set, specially set meetings in, mm -hmm. uh, in extreme circumstances, and I think we've done it for an employment waiver where there was a time is of the essence issue. I mean, we don't, you know, we don't set them as a matter of, of, of course, but sure. it is certainly possible to get a specially set meeting um, in, a, sure. in a very pressing situation. Um, but but Co certainly, we understand. Commissioner Hurd, um, I thought I understood you to be asking Mr. Selma if he would like to narrow his request to one that met the facts as he understands them for the Fort Mason position, recognizing that that may, if, if it's not offered to you, that may be unnecessary, but at least to take that um, potential roadblock out of the way or let us consider that. Did I, no, am I, I going I, further I, than you? I, I, I did ask whether, whether that was something so, mm -hmm. that would be helpful to Mr. Selna. I'm not sure whether, how far along we can go in that, but. Oh, whether you would be able to do it this evening. Oh, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. I didn't know, realize that's what you were asking. I thought you were asking down the road. Um, yeah, that would, I would more than welcome your input or a decision on that particular, um, that, that matter. And I'm happy to provide you with more detail about it if you'd like, to the extent that I know it. And again, so please, yeah, I'd be more than, more than happy for you to do that. And I can answer whatever questions may be, that I can answer that may be relevant to it. I suggest we uh, take public comment and then perhaps we'll invite you back up, Mr. Okay. Sona. Okay. Thanks very Thanks much. For your time. And, and again, I understand this is unprecedented and it's there, there are unknowns for you, but I, I, I truly do believe, you know, given the limited amount of time and the limited contacts that I had, it's a kind of a unique situation. So. Uh, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you considering it seriously, and, and I understand the, the challenge you're confronting. So thank you. I'd be happy to answer more questions if you want me to come back up. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Joe Boss. I'm a native of San Francisco, and um, I'm here because uh, I saw Rob Selden's name on your agenda as I was perusing my favorite thing, city government. Um, and uh, what I do for a living basically is strategy and outreach for businesses and developers. And it's really based on my activism in the neighborhood. I live in Dogpatch. I've been there for 28 years. and. Um, work on many, many different projects. I've been on a lot of task force, the uh, power plant task force for the Board of Supervisors or uh, zero emissions task force for the mayor. And um, I'm kind of a go-to person for the neighborhood, um, uh, successfully filing several different actions against Muni because they march by their own drummer, not because I'm trying to cost the city any duress or anything. But uh, what, what I have found is um, I probably get as many phone calls from supervisors or ledge aides or reporters uh, than probably twice as many as I ever make to try to drive a point or discover something. And um, I first met Rob Selna during uh, while the city was um, fighting a power plant at Petro, an expansion. And I've always found him to be the most straightforward and ethical reporter. Now, that may be an oxymoron. I don't know. But 
Um, and so when I saw that, I said, well, hmm, I, you know, good luck, Rob, with a, you know, uh, straight across the board waiver. But uh, so I guess I'm here as much as a character witness, as much as someone who is often accused of being a lobbyist because I may know who to call to file an appeal or I may know someone to call to try to get something resolved. Um, and uh, I'm not a fighter. I'm a solver. Uh, and I think you get a lot more accomplished with uh, uh, education than you do with placating. So that's why I'm here. And I really, anything you can do uh, for Mr. Selma, he's a great asset to the city or anyone he goes to work for. Very bright guy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boss. David Pilpel again. I just happen to have with me the uh, final EIS for the F-Line extension. Perhaps I can share that with Mr. Selna. We can go over it after the meeting. Um, I, I think that you've actually captured the, uh, the issue very well. I think that this request actually is a bit premature. I'm not sure, given both the description on the agenda and the amount of information that you have in writing, that you're able to evaluate a specific request um, with regard to the Fort Mason Center um, tonight. Um, I would also note, by the way, that the new executive director of the Fort Mason Center Foundation, a former city employee, is now on the city's Board of Appeals. So that, too, may create the appearance of some convoluted uh, mode of access. But aside from that, and I want to also be clear that I know Mr. Selna a little bit. He's a fine, fine fellow. And my comments are not really about his character, but about the nature of the request that's before you and the approval process for a waiver, having been through this uh, at many past meetings. I don't believe in this case that the criteria were met. I don't believe that you should grant um, a broad waiver in the way that's being proposed. I don't believe that you have enough facts for a specific waiver, and so I would recommend following further discussion that you not act on this tonight, but lay out some conditions perhaps for this to come back to you. And if it's so warranted, the usual practice is that the individual leaves city service, lines up some other opportunity, either starts with that without communicating to uh, city folks that that person is at that time unable to communicate with and then seeks the, the waiver and if granted is able to communicate. That's been the, the normal course of events um, and I see no reason for that to be different in this case. And just finally to reiterate a point that I've made um, several times before, where an individual is leaving city service in a compensated position is um, obtaining employment in another compensated position, I believe that that individual should have to pay some fee for the deliberation that you're now going through to consider this request. There's been uh, time at this meeting, staff time involved, your time, SFGTV. There's a lot of time that goes into processing these uh, requests that is not captured, and I think that that's something we should consider in the future where it's a compensated uh, position. I, I clearly see that the private interest is being served by this consideration, and I, I see much less that a public interest is served. I, I see that we're establishing a process, but I don't see that the general fund should have to bear the cost of these uh, requests. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, comments on this matter? I think going back to Commissioner Hand's point and, and, and looking at the language relating to the Fort Mason Center position, uh, it, it's not clear to me that, that there would even be any communication on behalf of uh, Fort Mason Center with MTA in this, in this position as it is currently described. And, and I, I am worried that it would be premature to grant a waiver However, my personal view is that, as described here, it, it seems like a waiver would be forthcoming if, if we were presented with um, the complete, you know, subject to whatever the complete facts are, 
based on what I see here, if, if Mr. Selna were to come back, I, this seems like a waiver that I would be in favor of. But as of now, I'm reluctant to um, grant him a waiver given that there is no position to consider. Any further thoughts or uh, questions for Mr. Selna? I have a question for staff related to this, but separate from the waiver. So I want to, when we are done with the waiver issues, I do have something else I'd like to ask staff. Okay. Uh, is, there a, is there a motion to grant the waiver? There being no motion, uh, at this point we cannot uh, grant the waiver. Ms. Singh, have I, have I screwed that up procedurally? I believe so, yes. Okay. <laughs> there needs to be a motion to... To deny it. Oh, no, no, I'm no, sorry. Did I... It was your question. <laughs> So sorry. Was your question, if there's no motion to grant the waiver, is this done? Are you done? I thought that was your question. The answer is yes, if that was your question. But if your, answer, your question was something else, I'm sorry. <laughs> you can ask me again. Okay. My, my, I think my question was had I screwed that up procedurally, but it sounds like it was not. It was procedurally fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Stalin, you wanted to say something? Uh, you said because there's no, you don't have enough information about the specific position that you cannot at this time entertain the possibility of a waiver. So it's it's my view, and as as one member of the commission, that that we're you're, you're, the request is premature in light of the fact that we don't have you know you don't have the position. You're not asking us uh, for a waiver for a specific position, and that it's not even clear that you would that the job would require communications with MTA at least according to, to your letter. Okay. Uh, going forward, w w just to give me an idea mm -hmm. going forward, if I wanted to come back before you in March, what would you need to know from me? What, do you, what, what are the things that uh, Mr. Pelpel mentioned the criteria? I, I, I read the code pretty, pretty clearly. Um, what, what things would you, would you like to know about uh, a prospective position? Because it may be a situation where I haven't, you know, necessarily nailed down the position and I'm trying to get it. I just don't know. So I'm, I'm just interested in ideas about what would be helpful for you all to hear from me with regard to a particular potential position or a or particular position. I, th I think in general uh, the, the, the key is potential. Um, I, I, think, I, I think what we, we don't want to see is sort of a... Uh, a request every month for jobs, every job you're applying for, um, because it, it, it's difficult for us to decide without something concrete as to what the issue, you know, what what the actual conflict is. Mm -hmm. um, it, I mean, it does sound like you've read the code and you understand what the criteria are, um, and and certainly a position that um, has as a requirement communication with a, a government entity would likely be more salient than one that, that didn't. I don't think I'm going out on a limb sure, when I sure, say that. Sure, sure, of course. Uh, but in general, I think you're going to be better off coming to us when you have a, when you have a position. And, and, and again, we understand the, the urgency that comes when, you, when you're trying to get, when you're applying for a job and you have this, this uh, ban. Um, and so we will uh, certainly do our best to be reasonable in, in responding. Okay. Um, you, you mentioned special meetings. I know there's a meeting in March. Uh, would you urge me to request a special meeting if I get to a situation where there's a, a more of an immediate answer that's required? I, I really am, I can't urge you either way, but I, but I suggest that you talk to staff, as I know you have in the past, um, mm -hmm. and and seek their guidance to the extent mm -hmm. that's relevant. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, 
I hope to be before you soon. Thank you, Mr. Selman. Good luck. All right. Thank you. My question for staff is this. Um, how are employees of um, the city advised of the ethics rules that apply to them? Um, it won't surprise you. What I'm reacting to is the paragraph on the last page of Mr. Selna's letter, which he said that he did not receive information about the one-year restriction. Um, and I think it then is broader than that. So I would just like to be reminded about how we advise what part of new employee, I think the current terminology is onboarding, yes. not a very attractive phrase, um, in the hiring and orientation process, bringing new employees on board. Uh, where in the hiring and orientation process are people advised that there are ethics rules that apply to them and in particular, uh, you know, I don't want to presume that it's not happening and I don't want to presume that it happened and he didn't understand it, but it did flag for me that at heart we don't want the rules that will apply to people to be a surprise to them. So it, it may be that it would be easier to tell us this um, in the future and just summarize for us what the process is by which somebody would know that they were covered by ethics rules, SIAs, and so forth, and in particular because this is a significant um, limitation on people within these offices, how they learn about it. Is their office supposed to tell them? Is it, you know, within the larger documents that they get? So up to you whether you want to tell us what you know now or... Uh, I can, I can just give you a, a very general response. Yep. Um, generally, all employees are provided an employee handbook that's issued by the city and county of San Francisco. How big? Um, not too big. Oh, okay. Not too big. But, but in the employee handbook, there's reference to the Ethics Commission. There's also reference to conflict of interest laws and the statement of incompatible activities. The, um, the handbook itself doesn't summarize every single rule. But uh, I believe employees are advised to contact the Ethics Commission if they have any questions. Um, so that's number one. Number two is that um, when our commission, when, when our staff provides ethics training, and we have done that um, for a number of uh, uh, departments in the past, especially when we're dealing with the statements of incompatible activities, when we were rolling them out, we talked about all the rules that govern city employees, uh, and in particular the post-employment rules. Um, we have not um, hit every single department, um, and, and one of them is uh, is the timing issue. One of them is uh, whether or not the other department has space available for us to provide the training. Um, but we try to do that. I mean, we do let people know, do let other departments know that we are available to provide training. The other, the third thing is that all these things are posted on our website. Um, um, the, the, one of the thing, I mean, I'm, it's um, we we try to inform people of what the what the rules are. We don't always succeed, um, and and I understand that, but we're always trying. You know, I, this um, my question isn't really related to this particular individual situation, but it's very. I mean, I, I can imagine um, that it's very easy to say, I will you're considering taking a new position, I will operate ethically, and if I am doing something that raises a question, I will go seek out what the rules are and conflicts, I will watch for conflicts, and that you think that what you're describing are a group of rules that you'll run into if there are uh, ethical concerns, and while they may not all be absolutely clear on their face, that uh, that this one is different in its type because it is a, an affirmative ban. It is a limitation that has nothing to do with whether you are getting involved in certain kinds of transactions. It is a restriction on what you can do after 
or may be able to do after you've taken this job, a, a, any job with, in this case, with um, the mayor's office or the board of supervisors, that is not obvious as a matter of common sense before you step in ethical, ethically sensitive territory, find out what you're allowed to do. This is, um, I may not be describing this very well, but it is, it is um, a restriction that many people might feel they ought to know about that doesn't come with simply I will be a responsible ethical employee of this agency that I'm joining. And I just wonder at some point whether we might do something to help people. And I, there's a lot that we can do, and we don't have time to hold everybody's hand through the orientation process. But there are, there are requirements like this that, or realities that sometimes people have to sign an affirmative letter at the time of hiring or that could be flagged within the orientation materials for city employees to just say uh, that this is something that you might want to be aware of before you, yeah, maybe it's too late at orientation when right. you've taken the job. Yeah. Um, maybe it should be part of the offer letter. Um, it just is significant enough and unusual enough because it's not common a, a common sort of limitation in the private sector or in academia or other kinds of roles that um, might be worth calling attention to. What I can't say is whether this is the most important of those. It may be that if we actually ask ourselves the question, are people learning about enough when they enter city service about the way these rules could affect them, this may not be the most important of them, or it may, be, may not be the one that is the most surprising to people. But um, it, it may just be a matter of having our education staff person aware of this question and thinking about it, especially in the roles where we did change it recently, um, and, ha and therefore it has government-wide effect, which is just to just ask if we are being helpful and um, letting people know about that consequence of entering public employment. End of speech. Commissioner Mahan. Well, as a follow-up, uh, my question is, what is the penalty for actually violating this uh, particular uh, uh, rule? I mean, what's to prevent people from just but going ahead? Sort of with, accidentally or innocent. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, yeah. the same way that other things are, you know, someone reports there's a whistleblower and somebody brings it to our attention, mm -hmm. but there's no kind of active oh. enforcement of this rule, is there? Um, the, the penalties are the same penalties that apply to any violations of the conflict of interest laws. So there could be criminal penalties, administrative penalties, civil penalties, injunctive relief. Um, we've never really encountered this um, where we became aware of somebody violating the post-employment rules. Thank you, Commissioners. I think point well taken. The next item on the agenda is the election of the chair and vice chair to serve for the coming year. Uh, are there, is there a nomination for the chair? Well, I would like to nominate uh, um, our current chair for a second term. Um, are there any other? I, I understand that we don't need seconds for nominations. Uh, yes. Are there? Are there any other uh, nominations? Uh, maybe we'll take public comment on this. <laughs> <laughs> any discussion among the commissioners? I would let the record reflect that we got a thumbs up from public comment on that nomination. <laughs> <laughs> Two thumbs up. Uh, all, all in favor. Raise ipsa. <laughs> uh, all in favor of the nomination for chair. Aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Uh, 
so the so I guess I have been re-elected chair for the coming year. Uh, nominations for vice yes. chair. Uh, nominations for vice chair. I nominate Commissioner Studley for vice chair, the, and as she is in her current position. Uh, any other nominations for vice chair? Public comment. I'm certainly in, in support. I just want to be clear. The leadership of this commission involves um, not just what we see in public, but a lot of discussion with staff on timing and appropriateness of, of things. And I appreciate the work that happens that we don't see. And I hope the other three commissioners will think about uh, their roles in the future since you serve longer terms than uh, some. So we. The, the public out here does expect some level of rotation, so don't think that if you're not getting hit this time that, you know, we're not going to ask at some point in the future. But with that, you're both doing a fine job, and so are all of you. Thank you very much. The rules, as well the, as the, pub <laughs> the rules as well as the public require a certain degree of rotation as well. We can't get entrenched. <laughs> <laughs> Is there... Uh, we've had a nomination, so we need a vote. Uh, all in favor of the nomination of Commissioner Studley to remain as vice chair? Aye. Aye. Opposed? There being none, uh, Commissioner Studley is elected as the vice chair. The next item on the agenda is the minutes of the commission's meeting of January 23rd. Commissioners, any I know what I comments or changes? Missing. Um, there's just one spelling error um, for Hillary Ronan. We understand the correct spelling is R O N E N. Okay. Any other comments from the commissioners? Public comment? David Kopel, um, just two items that I noticed on page three in the middle. Donna Marion, Human Resources Director of the San Francisco, I think it should say Public Library, to be clear. And at the top of page four, the reference to Deputy City Attorney Shen, I think should probably be spelled out, Deputy City Attorney. We often say DCA, but I think the minutes should be a little more formal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, with those changes, uh, do, would anybody like to discuss those changes? Uh, with those changes, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the January 2012 meeting? So moved. Is there second. a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, there being none, that motion passes. Uh, just for clarification, does uh, Commissioner Rennie vote in that? Well, Even though I, he was not here, I didn't. I didn't know anything about it. Yes, you do vote. Okay. Uh, I don't think Commissioner Rennie voted, so maybe we need to. Uh, no, I did. I you did, did vote. Yes, okay. I, okay. Okay. You didn't ask for an abstention, so I voted. <laughs> okay. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the executive director's report. Has the executive director succumbed to the? Uh, uh, Dread disease that's running all over town. Is that what the executive happens? director is, is seeking? Yes, is, is uh, indeed has indeed appeared to have succumbed to that nasty virus. Any questions or comments from the commissioners with respect to the executive director's report? Public comment. Uh, David Pilpel again. I think that there were a couple of typos on page three about the year. It wasn't the November 2012 uh, meetings. I believe it was November 2011. Page three in the middle. We're, we're now in 2012. Right. Yeah. That were approved by the commission at its October and November 2012 meetings. I don't think those have happened time. yet. Oh. The second gotcha, line, not gotcha. first. Right. Thank you. Um, 
I, I would note that the legislation that was Twice. at the Rules Committee last week and the previous week actually are both at the board tomorrow, I believe. Um, so we'll see what happens there. Perhaps they will seek a legislative solution and we will not be on the ballot. We will see how that all um, rolls out. There was one other thing here and I forget what now. Um, oh, it's nice to see that uh, Dr. Greer is now off the BDR list. I've mentioned before that there were a number as in three current or former members of the college board on the, the BDR list, and I think we should seek ways to uh, deal with the other two. It seems odd to me that a seven-member elected board would have three current or former members with fines outstanding. That seems like something we should try to avoid. I'll leave it at that for the moment. More in a bit. Thanks. I do have a question that I would um, have asked the executive director. Um, I understand why it's not in his report. It, we're attempting to schedule the uh, joint meeting with the Sunshine Task Force. Do you know how that is proceeding? Yes. So we had a tentative date of February 24th where uh, all the ethics commissioners could attend the uh, Sunshine Ordinance Task Force had an issue, a staffing issue, and so ended up not being able to attend the meeting at that at that time. I know the executive director is currently trying to schedule the meeting and, and negotiating schedules, uh, but it's proven pretty difficult in March, so it, it sounds like the meeting is going to happen in April at this point, which is certainly later than any of us uh, wanted, but logistics. Uh, we would like to have as much participation as possible, so that's that's one of the issues we're dealing with. The last date that I heard was March 23rd as a possibility, but then a member of the Sunshine Ordinance Task Force had um, an illness that came up. So I, I think you're, you've all made yourselves available, and it's kind of on them to be available. I look forward to that meeting happening in our lifetime. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is items for future meetings. Public comment. <coughs> David Pilpel, last item for tonight. I was going to do it either here or in general public comment, but I think this is a, a fine place. I'm a, aware of a recent complaint that was shown to me by one of the complainants or co-complainants um, and a uh, response letter. I don't know if it was a dismissal letter or a, it was a, a form of a dismissal letter. And I'm, and I don't, I'm not sure that I want to be specific about the complaint. And I'm actually not sure if you all have seen either the complaint or the letter because of the nature of the thing. It may have been dismissed by staff at an early stage such that it did not get to you, but I'm not clear about how all of those complaints work within the regs. In any event, the, issue as I understand it was that it was not brought for it was the matter was terminated because there wasn't sufficient evidence that the individual was personally and substantially involved in a specific matter my concern is the understanding of the terms personally and substantially <coughs> involved my understanding was different about what that meant, that it was more broadly involved in a matter, but yet personally and substantially. My new understanding is that staff views it in a different way as relates to the rights and uh, obligations of parties more in a legal or contractual sense, and I'm not sure that a, that's the only way to interpret it, nor am I sure that that was what the original intent was about uh, personally and substantially involved in a specific matter. So it's, I think it's difficult to talk about these things in the abstract, but maybe with some specific examples or hypotheticals, it would be worth having a, a bit of a public discussion on what was intended by personally and substantially involved, because I suspect that if this was I suspect this was either not the last complaint that we'll see 
in that form and that there will be others particularly as we talked earlier tonight about uh, the post-employment waiver and what that means going forward. I think it's, it's helpful to have some understanding of what people think that means. Is that good for specific and yet vague? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pelton. Thank you. Items, uh, public comment on matters appearing or not appearing on the agenda. Uh, hearing none, uh, Mr. Rennie, welcome to the Ethics Commission. Thank you for participating in your first meeting. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.